Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Jason Freeman. I'm a producer and editor here in the Author Events office. And tonight, it's my great honor and pleasure to introduce Jan Winner. The co-founder, co-editor, and publisher of Rolling Stone, Jan Winner has influenced the ways in which the world perceives music, politics, and pop culture for nearly 50 years. Not bad for a 21-year-old guy who borrowed 7,500 bucks from family members to start a magazine in 1967. Called the greatest editor of his generation by many of his peers, Winner is also the founder and publisher of Outside US Weekly, Family Life, and Men's Journal, and he was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and the American Society of Magazine Editors uh, Hall of Fame. He joins us tonight with his book, Like a Rolling Stone, a memoir, praised by the boss himself as a touchingly honest memoir from a man who recorded and shaped our times and of a grand life well lived. Like a Rolling Stone tells the story of Winner's life and generation as it charts his association with rock stars, journalists, artists, politicians, and thought leaders way, way, way too numerous to mention. Uh, tonight's author will be in conversation with Philly's own David Frick, one of music journalism's uh, biggest names. David is a senior editor at Rolling Stone and a DJ on Sirius XM Radio. He's also written for other preeminent music magazines, is a three-time winner of the ASCAP Deems Taylor Award for Excellence in Music Journalism, and he's appeared in music documentaries, uh, music documentaries about Pink Floyd, Nirvana, Lou Reed, Wilco, and again, too many other numerous, numerous artists and groups to mention. So without further ado, folks, please join me in welcoming Jan Winner and David Frick to the Free Library. This is actually, this is unusual, because usually when I was in your office, you were asking me questions. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a little different. David had the only other job at Rolling Stone that I wanted, uh, which was to travel with the groups. Uh, David, you did like a, at least 150 tours. At least 100, yeah. And, and I would look at the friends and see, oh, well, David's in Australia, or he's in this <laughs> place, or that place. <laughs> And that oh, was before me. cell phones, too, so yeah. it wasn't that easy to find me. Right, and before Zoom. And, and you, before you Zoom. You don't get to travel now. Um, as, uh, as Jason mentioned, I am from Philly. This is a hometown gig. Um, uh, I actually lived right up the way, up right up the parkway, 22nd and Wallace Street. And I will point out that my first issue, I don't know if you realize this, but my first issue of Rolling Stone was number 19, dated October 12th of 1968. It was one with Jagger on the cover, and you ran the uncensored cover mm, yeah. of Beggar's Banquet. And I bought it downtown in Center City over at a head shop on Sansom Street. <laughs> and I remained a subscriber well into the 80s. Actually, I was still getting my subscription after I started working there. Um, then I started freelancing for the magazine in New York City. And in fact, Rolling Stone had a lot to do with my move to New York because my first story ran in issue 244, June 30th of 77. It was a memory this guy's got. <laughs> That's why I Look did the research. <laughs> It was a news report on a federal grand jury investigation into alleged antitrust violations in the Philadelphia concert promotion scene. I don't have to mention who was being investigated. <laughs> Suffice to say, I was effectively banned from every rock show in town, so I moved to New York and I got to work at Rolling Stone. So this 40 years later, actually 40, man, it's like 40 some years later, I've lost count, I get to sit here with Jan Winner on the occasion of this memoir, which I highly recommend, Like a Rolling Stone. Now, we talked a little bit about this back there, and I want to ask how much did the writing of the book, the actual physical and mental act of sitting down, establishing a voice, choosing words, filtering memories, figuring out the truth of sometimes what you remember. How much did that take you back to your beginnings as a writer? Because in the book, you talk a lot about your work in high school at Berkeley, uh, on the papers there, freelancing for magazines in San Francisco. How much did this take you back to that? Well, this is a long answer. <laughs> it's a long question. Long. 
I, first of all, I enjoyed the process enormously. I started out to be a writer. I thought that's what I would do when I was really looking for my first job after Ramparts when I was 20 years old, 21. And uh, I had buy, and I, I was I freelance for a couple of magazines in San Francisco, and I was writing a column for the Daily Californian, and you know I was having fun doing. That was my identity as a writer. I had a little portable typewriter. That was my little thing I traveled with, and I liked. And you know you could sit down sometimes, think you were in a relationship with it, or you're talking. To it. it felt very familiar to sit there. But uh, so I lost my full time job as an editor at Ramparts and doing a little writing, and then I was asked to do a to review Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band for a magazine con called High Fidelity, which was then one of the leading music magazines in the United States. Anyway, it got rejected because they said I was too hyperbolic. Like, I don't know, so. <laughs> How can you be hyperbolic about Sgt. Well, Pepper? Well, that's what I thought. But So I realized that um, I, as much as I wanted to write a freelance, I, I, well, it had to be about rock and roll, and I wasn't going to get published anywhere. So I'd have to start my own. Anyway, so I got into the editing business and took to it like right away and realized, as I point out in this book, that I've been doing it since, you know, I was 10 years old. I've been published in a newspaper of some kind in junior high school and high school, after high school, this, that, and the other thing. But anyway, to the experience of writing it, when you, when you start writing, first of all, you kind of like do it by rote, you know, try and move through it fast. And it doesn't really work that well that way. It's kind of plain and uninteresting. And I realized soon enough that you had to bring yourself right back to that moment you were writing about, you know? Otherwise, you could write in a cliche, and you couldn't get any real feel for it. So really, the process was re to get it right, to get the writing kind of sharp or at least meaningful and out of the realm of cliches, you had to just bring yourself right back to that particular moment, whether it's a concert or a death or a meeting with people or the fun of being back, whatever it was, and just close your eyes, think about it, and you soon find yourself back in that physical situation of the, where it was that took place. And then you can start to sort out how you're feeling and emotional and what was the point of it and what did you learn from that stuff. So in the end, after over the three years, it was like reliving you know, your entire life. And that's really fun. That's really a pleasure. You go through all the kind of sadnesses. You go through all the kind of loves, lost loves, all the joys. I mean, it was, it was wonderful. And that, and that informed it. And you find... Also, in, in writing it, and I did it chronologically, um, how all of a sudden all the pieces are starting to fit together. And you never really understand until you get the very end. And then I quoted Bob Dylan at the beginning of the book talking about him looking at a song that Kurt Wilde had written and not understanding it until the, the, he finished all that and realizing that as Rams looked, Kurt Wilde had plotted, it had all been carefully plotted he said, nailed to the wall until it was all nailed to the wall. He didn't get it. And it, it all fits, you know, of course, because what else can fit? Um, anyway, does that sort of answer the that question? That was good. Oh, okay. That good. was good. All right. All right. What am I, the other but, and I say, I had really a lot of fun doing it. The sort of secondary part of that is when you did start editing, and really with that seriousness of the first issues of Rolling Stone, what was it about editing that appealed to you maybe more than writing? Was it the ability to shape, to build and shape an aesthetic outside the writing itself? Not really. It was, um, I didn't have the time to do it myself, although for the first five or six issues, I wrote half of them at least, uh, all of it. Um, and um, it was just easier, you know, to work on somebody else. You know, let somebody else do the reporting and the thinking and the listening to the record to review it and all that stuff. I didn't really have the time to do it. And, and as it got bigger, I, just, I was doing the editing and trying to shape it and make it, you know, read well and be sensibly and be professional. Uh, I'll admit to having edited not just sometimes for clarity, but also for point of view and purpose. And I, my first big showdown was with John Landau, uh, who, who was, you know, our first really important prominent critic and he and he accused me and I had to admit it that every time I'd he'd send us some review of a west coast act and it would come back at it he knew I was doing it totally because I disagreed with his point of view about the west coast he refused to be a shill 
for advertisers only, and if I didn't print his stuff the way it was. And I admit, I was cutting out his negative stuff about the West Coast groups, you know. But um, One of the things that you mentioned in the book, which I thought was interesting, you mentioned one of, I think it was your final report card in high school, where you had something of a mixed experience. <laughs> um, but you quote a summation you got from civics class. It has been a pleasure to have this intelligent, aggressive, and rambunctious young man in my class. And when I saw that, I thought, you know, that sounds a lot like the guys you hired. Was that, did, was it sort of like, see yourself in some of the people that you were bringing into the fold or who approached you and wanted to write? Was that yeah, kind absolutely. of the thing all, you were looking for? In yeah, writers? absolutely. There are problems that they're also difficult to get along with. But <laughs> they are the people who are talented and ambitious, will make trouble. Don't worry about making trouble. They're the people you wanted to have. I mean, there's certainly nobody more rambunctious, intelligent, ambitious than Hunter. You know, and, and you know. But yeah, you know, that spirit. We, we, we assembled all these young people at the time who uh, had something to say and full of energy and didn't have to have $100,000 a year or whatever, didn't have really too many to have families to support. So they didn't need a lot of money. We didn't have a lot of money. But they wanted the freedom. And uh, they wanted to say something. They wanted to do something meaningful. They wanted a high bar to ri raise to, rise to, rise to. Do you think that if you had been in another city, L.A. or New York, say, that you would have been able to, A, found the magazine with the facilities and the finances and the spirit that you did, and would it have survived? I think it, well, just a second. I think I could have done it in L.A., possibly not New York, but I, I'm not sure. I, I think that San Francisco was just the ideal place to grow, kind of like a greenhouse. We were sheltered from all the ambitions in the music industry and the magazine business in L.A. or New York. We were able to, I don't, it would have been very hard to resist the pressures of commercialization or what the record companies want us to do or managers would be, you know, constantly coming around. And, and as, as we are young and beginning and, and delicate flower, I don't know that we would have survived it. We might have started, been able to start it there, but, and then it, it just gave us all that room for a long time, just develop on our own, find ourselves, make our mistakes quietly. You know, there's an ethic and a laissez-faire lifestyle there that we were p coming from and part of and they were advocating for, you know, kind of a general attitude. I, uh, and it was a particular cultural moment of freedom in San Francisco then, and, and, and of the arts. I mean, it was the, when we came along, we were the air, the, the, just the beatnik era just closed in the in 50, end of the 50s and 60s, and the music scene was thriving, and drugs were rampant there for the first time, you know, in a big city anywhere, and it was a hotbed of political activism. The activism and the student movement started there, really. The college student movement of the 60s began there, not at Columbia in 68, but in Berkeley in 64, and as I said, the Black Panthers and the University of California and other universities were sending tons of students down south to ride in the Freedom Rides and do that. So it was a ferment, you know, of all those things that gave life to us and that we advocated for and that we covered and we wrote about and so enchanted the rest of the United States looking at that. I want to be like that. I want to be there. I want to be part of that. And I failed to mention that long list. Music. Oh, I did. The music scene there. And the music scene there was also, you know, it was, it became the big stopover for everybody from all of the cities of the country and around the world. I mean, if you were touring, the one place you were absolutely going to have to go and the hippest place in the country is to go to the Bill Graham venues in San Francisco. So every musician and he, you know, whether it's blues musician or the English musician came over and were in San Francisco and stayed there and influenced by it. It was a, it was a germane breeding ground for all that. And, and I'll try to make this the last thing, at that same summer of 67 that we started was the summer of the Monterey Pop Festival, the summer of 
KMPX Radio, which is the very first underground FM freeform station. And it was well where Bill Graham started. And it was where we started. And it was sending out a message from those places across all those voices of rock and roll were all sending out a message around the world, you know, come on, join the fun, you know, come on, get in. Sergeant Peppers was saying that to everybody. Monterey, we were radio. It was just the moment. But Magic. it's also one of the things that's interesting about the beginnings, and I've gone through a lot of the early issues, even the ones before um, I got mine, at my first one. And I think being in San Francisco gave you an access to those early interviews you did. You did Hendrix in the first year, Pete Townsend in the first year. That was the interview in which he basically laid out the entire concept of Tommy, Mike Bloomfield, or Clapton, you had an access to them that I think if you were operating out of New York or LA, there would have been channels to go through. There would have been PR people, labels. You know, in a city like San Francisco, I'm guessing that in a sense there was an access that you had because people were more relaxed in that kind of um, stratification, that, you know, uh, caste system didn't exist. True. Although the caste system as it existed in other cities was not nearly what it became today. I mean, was the, the business wasn't big enough to have such a huge PR machine. And in those days, the PR machine that did exist was helpful because they wanted PR. Now their job is to find the style. God knows what's going on today. <laughs> anyway, um, but also the musicians, by and large, were aware of us and really wanted to be a part of Rolling Stone, because it was the first thing I ever saw that wasn't like, you know, Circus or 16 or Billboard. And oh my God, they did ran a serious interview with, you know, Mike Bloomfield or something. And everybody thought, you know, oh, well, these kids are serious. Also, when you get to San Francisco, if you're a rock actor, there's nothing to do, you know, buy clothes. <laughs> and the other thing you do is hang out at Rolling Stone or with Rolling Stone reporters who are wanting to come and hang around the hotel room with you and take pictures and at the shows. And, you know, it just, it felt it was so easy and family then. I mean, to arrange an interview, I mean, I just show up backstage, and someone, you know, say hello to Pete. You know, you know, say, hey, well, well, you say hello we... to Pete, and all of a sudden, a half hour later, he's still saying hello back. Yeah, <laughs> you know him, don't you? Uh, <laughs> so, um, to, or to remember, it was easy just to arrange directly and uh, kind of not among equals, but without all this nonsense about it and stagecraft, and, and people were straightforward and direct. I mean, the stakes were much lower then. And um, the stuff that was said and done that was intimate, and, and musicians really responded to the idea of a respectful, thoughtful, intelligent question, rather than, you know, what color do you like, or you know, look like in girls, or stuff. And really, that's what it was. I mean, until we came along, all the Beatles were asked, what they looking, looking for in a girl? You know, that, I mean, anyway. Mick Jagger said we, we invented the long, long interview in which we had to answer serious questions like, what kind of drugs do you take? <laughs> 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 what do you think about Vietnam? <laughs> well, when you first began discussing the founding of Rolling Stone with Ralph, with Ralph Gleason, Ralph J. Gleason, the legendary columnist on jazz and rock at that time for the San Francisco Chronicle, was there... A, a voice or an aesthetic that you both envisioned coming out of that music and culture? Because, you know, Ralph came from daily newspaper reporting, as did you. He also wrote, um, and you quote this essay that he did, uh, it was in actually sort of, I guess, late 66, early 67 mm -hmm. at uh, the American Scholar, which is an academic journal. And he likened the Stones, the Beatles, and Dylan to the quote from Plato about music as a force to make, quote, the walls of the city shake and fall. Was that part of your intent? Was it simply the confluence of what was happening in the society in that city and the music as well as the resonance spreading across the country? How much of this did you and Ralph actually discuss and articulate before you actually went to press? Well, at length. I mean, it was that, that was the context of all our conversations before coming up with the idea of starting Rolling Stone. And then the purpose of starting Rolling Stone was that. And the name Rolling Stone comes from 
that essay, I mean, she titled Like a Rolling Stone, which she laid out really the philosophical underpinnings of, of the magazine in a really articulate way, saying the forms of music do not, do not change without the walls of the city shaking, something like that, and pointing out that the real poets of our time were Dylan, you know, and, and the Stones, and Simon Garfunkel, and these were the people with passion to understand what was going on in our society. And it wasn't the guys in suits, it wasn't pop music thing, and it wasn't the politicians. Ralph was also a big, big backer of the free speech movement in Berkeley. And I met him shortly after that. So he understood what it meant, you know, and, and it was extraordinary coming from him because at the time, because he was a jazz columnist primarily, and, and, and all the jazz purists, you know, looked at how can he possibly think the Beatles are any good? I mean, and I was saying, wait, these people can write songs, like, fuck, their harmonies are brilliant. And, but they thought, oh, it's too stuffy. So he was 48 years old. And so they used to make fun of him. They say, well, he's a, he's a 48 year old who can't make up his mind whether he's three 16 year olds or 12 or four 12 year olds. <laughs> and he loved that. Um, but it's interesting because when I started but, reading Ralph, and I actually got a copy of his book, The San Francisco Sound, mm -hmm. uh, when it came out, the thing that I found interesting about him was that I, I knew him from the jazz writing because I read Downbeat mm -hmm. in the high school library. But I also thought of him as someone who, at an age when people are thought to be becoming set in their ways, set in their tastes, he was out every night listening for the new thing mm -hmm. and actually supporting it with, you know, an unbelievable pulpit, which is a, a, a daily newspaper in one of the most exciting music cities in the country. I, th I thought of him as... You know, I thought of him as my ideal. I did too. And then when you get to him and you think, I mean, it's a story that somebody at age 50, more or less, will be going out looking for this new thing and, and it's being done by teenagers, you know, but he's, he's responding to music in it. And he was a, an extraordinary man. I mean, he's never gotten his full due. And I, I've given him a lot in, in this book, but he, he was a hero, you know, he was a, uh, you know, You'll see it in my book. I mean, all the greatest musicians, jazz musicians and other musicians uh, relied on him, and I didn't. It was the only voice, reading that column when I was in college, the only voice of Sandy I could hear or a voice that understood what I was going through. Ralph acted in many ways on behalf of many things. He single-handedly saved Bill Graham in the San Francisco scene by using the Chronicle to face down the San Francisco Police Department, which was trying to shut down the film more than saying cops to close them. And he gave breath and life to it all. He loved the joy of youth. He loved the sarcasm of Dylan and all that stuff. He was a huge backer of Lenny Bruce. I mean, he was a... <sighs> he was one of the few guys that Miles Davis got along with. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and our tribute issue to After Ralph died, Miles Davis just wrote one piece, Give Me My Friend Back. You know, that was his... Well, I would highly recommend that you read all of Ralph's columns in the original issues of Rolling Stone. His book, San Francisco Sound, is really an important uh, document from that actual time of, of everybody that was happening, interviews wait, with wait, Garcia. Wait, wait, wait. You don't have to do that. I'm, no. He's dead. I'm alive. No. Read this. But, well, actually, you Buy know what? This. I want to, no, no, no. No, I actually, I want to tell you. He doesn't one, need the money anymore. He doesn't need the money anymore. He's the one, I, but actually, I wanted to share this because it actually has a lot to do with my work for you. Okay. Um, I was working for a paper here in Philadelphia called The Drummer, and I reviewed uh, his anthology, Celebrating the Duke, mm. which came out in 1975. Yeah. And I was such a fan and really an acolyte of his work that the lead of the piece was when I grow up I want to be Ralph Gleason and I printed it it was nice I got a letter back apparently the review reached uh, a woman who was the PR person at Fantasy Records uh -huh. and she passed it on to Ralph's wife Jean uh -huh. Uh -huh. and she wrote me a note a handwritten note back thanking me for that sentiment but letting me know that Ralph's advice to me would be to find my own voice in the work. And I still have that letter. That was a very instructive thing, and it had a lot to do with my approach 
to the opportunities that I got when I started writing for Rolling Stone, which is don't imitate the other guy, find your own way. So he was actually still taking care of business after we lost him. Well, it's interesting to note in that respect that you mentioned you'd won the Deems Taylor Award several times. Ralph won those, that same award several times. Very, the be highest accolade in music writing. So congratulations, you owe it to Ralph. And then <laughs> you, you did, you know, you developed a style that's completely unique to anybody else that wrote at the time at Rolling Stone that, you know, that people tried to imitate. I tried to imitate a bunch of times. <laughs> You know, which, shall I characterize it? <laughs> David, David can't write about a sound of a single note without three adverbs or adjectives attached to how that note sounds. So you get something like the purple twangy wine of <laughs> this, you know, or the, you know, the fossilized bass, you know, boom. I, anyway, you get my point. I think I actually but, once described Jeff Beck's distortion as sounding like a snorting pig. Well, yeah, and this, yeah, anyway. so... You know, um, your those early interviews I mentioned earlier that you did with Hendrix, Clapton, Mike Bloomfield, that was a real foundation piece for me, and and Townsend, that became a signature format, which was the Rolling Stone interview. Given that, as you talked about, the precedent of most interviews of musicians at the time were not nearly as serious, what did you want? your interviews with these artists to accomplish? And how did that idea evolve over time as the magazine grew in authority and actually, I think importantly, in access? Well, I, it, it was a premise that both Ralph and I had that, that there were two great forms, formats for interviews at that time. And one was the Playboy interview, which got lots of really important people and really spent a lot of time interviewing them, got them very in-depth and asking them. It was a very serious forum. And the other was the Paris Review, which did that with writers, which went to writers and talked about their work and asked them how they worked and what their schedules were as they worked. They worked in the morning and something like that, and their ideas. And they were, the Paris Review was a real interview with a working artist and about the sources of the art and the managing of that art and the accomplishment of it. The Playboy interview was also another in-depth look at the kind of thinking, feelings, and life, and times of any particular individual, controversial as could be, in which they could really express themselves in a very clear, important way. So we wanted to do something, combine them both. And our interviews, by and large, tried to be highly biographical, highly personal, and kind of personal philosophy, a lot about the particular music songs, the the writing of those things, how you did it, and attitudes about the times. And, and um, they were best at that, but we were able to give it length, and to the extent we gave it length, we were more and more successful. But that f format turned, turned out to be incredibly popular with readers and with the people who were doing it and doing the interviews. It was going to be a straight, unfiltered conversation between them and their audience. Uh, I did a lot of them then. I was particularly good at interviewing. And... Uh, knew how to relate to talent, what talent was about, and how to kind of get them to talk about it. I mean, if you, if you show enthusiasm for somebody else's work, unlike David has done tonight, uh, <laughs> they get really turned on to discuss it, you know, want to discuss it in depth and detail. I mean, it's something they're very proud of. But you have to approach on that level, and you have to come in deeply researched and prepared and thoughtful and... You know, so I think that would be a secret that we both shared or learned on a job, and you know, and some and others we cultivated that. Because there was actually an interview, um, the first interview Jonathan Cott did so with John Lennon, yeah. um, which was in issue 22, November 68. Um, it was the issue where you published the Two Virgins album cover, mm -hmm. you know, front and back without uh, censorship. But there was something at the start of the interview which uh, Jonathan quoted, and it was something that Lennon said that actually resonated with me. It was just before the start of the actual interview, and what John Lennon said to Cut was, there's nothing more fun than talking about your own songs and your own records. I mean, you can't help it. It's your bit, really. But then what he added was, remember, we do this together. 
we are doing, we are talking about these things together and always remember that, which I took to mean this is supposed to be a learning process for both of us. You may be asking questions, mm -hmm. I may be, you may be asking questions, mm -hmm. I may be answering them, but we're going to come to something, a new mm -hmm. place together. And I, that really resonated with me because my impulse as a writer and now on the radio and anything I do in music is I want to find out, as you say, how the music was made, who made it, the impulses, the process, the experience of putting it in the world, and what it feels like when it gets there. And the fact that Lennon articulated that so early on, mm -hmm. I think shows how the artists understood mm -hmm. the magazine's position and mission. And I think so, I'd never seen that part before. I mean, that, that remember in context, this was probably the first interview that John had ever given since, it was all about, the Fab Four and the Beatles. They mean inside the Beatle bubble. I mean, when he said, we're more popular than Jesus, he, they shut him down, they locked him up, and all of them. So I think the premise for it was that I know this is not going to be about what my favorite color is, and let's do this together, which would be a very John thing to want to do. And also, I think, recognizing Jonathan Cott, that he had a, a collaborator of real intelligence. You know, it should take two seconds. By now. John, the God speaking, being prepared, always in every interview you've ever seen Rolling Stone, he was probably Rolling Stone's greatest interviewer, uh, with an incredibly wide range. He would always come to the interview, and he would know the artist's work cold, and then he would have some five quotes from, you know, Martin Buber or, <laughs> you know, Kierkegaard or somebody. I remember the 1977 interviews he did. He started quoting Hasidic scripture. Right. And I'm like, what? And, and so you're kind of, if you're Dylan, you're kind of flabbergasted, but. You have to respond to it. You know, he'd know more about the person's work in a way than the person did. And, and then you get enormously respectful of being part of this really serious, intense process. And, the collab and it is a collaboration, as John was probably the first person to say. Well, at one point in the book, you write, at the one-year mark, we had established who we were, where we were going, and what we would cover. And you also mentioned this. We were in the music business the hippie business, and the magazine business. Each had its own priorities, values, and ideas. They often conflicted. When push came to shove, which, ultimately, was the most important to you? Ah, me. <laughs> <laughs> That's but, a I good, mean, honest answer. What, what I thought, you know? Yeah. I mean, I wanted to get, make everybody happy, and it was important that you know, we satisfy all these people in, to some extent, but I had to do what was right for me and what I saw was right. And if people wanted to say fuck all the time, you know, th and it didn't work for other people, then fine. I don't, you know, you arbitrate among these different interests. I couldn't be absolutely loyal to the hippies or absolutely loyal to the record business or, you know, absolutely loyal to the magazine business. We just had to find our own way, you know, but everybody had to be served. As Bob said, you know, you, you got to serve somebody. got to serve somebody. You know? Well, what did you ultimately learn from launching the first UK edition of Rolling Stone in 1969? And what did you learn from its demise? Because your partner in this was Mick Jagger, and which would have been a very rare instance at the time of a cover subject helping to run the circus. <laughs> You, the clowns running the circus is what you're trying I, to say. I, I just said the cover subject. The cover subject. Well, <laughs> I mean, Mick was a pleasure and easy to deal with, and I learned a lot about him. We you know, really formed a big friendship around that. But about the UK, I mean, I learned a bunch of things. They don't have the same journalistic standards that we have. You know, the United, the United Kingdom journalism has a lot of essay writing and opinion making, and very few people actually report. I learned that London and England in general is a pretty dumb, pretty Provincial? obtuse place in terms of doing business. It was hard to do business with. Was, was, it, was, it, was, was it almost too provincial? Too provincial in a way, but, you know, they just didn't have that drive that Americans had to succeed and make money. You know, all that American, going to get it done for you tomorrow, stuff was for, out the window. So, I mean, it, it, was, it was just a tough place 
to do business, it was slow. And I was there, going to do the only for a week, but not to spend, you know, two hours on a train, going up to Peterborough to talk to a printer, and come back. And it was just, it didn't have that spark and drive. On the other hand, it was charming to be there, wonderful, I had a great time, you know, and learned a lot. But uh, it was very tough to find the kind of talent that we were looking for. I mean, it was lazy. It was easy, you know, and the, the demise of Rolling Stone there was partially it was leaderless because Mick left, you know, soon after to make a movie, and I wasn't around, and the, the, you don't find the right people right away, and they were all kind of nice and pleasant, but they were kind of a little lazy and hippie-ish, and, you know, it's just, you know. Did it sometimes, did it make you wonder, though, about the difficulty? Well, I had a great time in No, oh. of, of actually maintaining journalistic objectivity in an enterprise built on essentially a fundamental subjectivity, which is, as you say, your passions, your goals, and the relationships that evolved from your engagement and advocacy for the artists you cared about. Well, again, several prong answer. In the first place, the artists that we cared about and the subject we covered, yeah, these guys, these people, men and women, are making art, they're making, no they're making joyful noise, they're there to make your lives better, they're living a good life, they're doing no harm to society, they're artists, they're not politicians, they're not making cigarettes, they're not oil barons, and people who need some tough co coverage. They're, we're there to, we were their primary support, you know, and, 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 and evangelize for, and promote and tell the world about, you know, so we, we, that kind of conflict rarely came up. There's never really any conflict whatsoever about somebody trying to get a good or record review or something like that from us. I mean, if so, it was subtle. But I think the artists and the industry perceived that we were going to be independent no matter what you tried. It just wasn't going to work. And that what was important about Rolling Stone was its integrity and its honesty. And that, that was what it made it so important to its audience and to the, other, to the artists and to the industry that that credibility of this institution be preserved at all costs. Now, it's to say some people trying to cross the line, but none of them were the people who were my friends. I mean, I never got, and the only time I got put in an awkward position was after Altamont when we decided to cover it, and we knew that would then put, intend to, would put blame in part on stones, and that would upset Mick, who was, I had just gone out of business with, and it was a friend of mine, and whose relationship, personally and, and for the magazine, I cher we cherish, but there was not really a question about it, more than a second, about what I was gonna do, either pull the, pull the strings, you know, so it didn't, the stones were not blamed for anything. That was also right in your truth. backyard, too. Yeah, I mean, it was our story, we, so it was a big, huge story for us, and, uh, but, so I never really had that problem managing much of a conflict, you know. Sometimes some advertisers would try a little, or a manager would be a little, you know, annoying, but uh, n none of my friends, I mean, everybody saw this as a wrong way to go about it, and so I was blessed by that. I want to ask, as an original reader of this piece, um, and as someone who rereads it often, the epic interview you did with John Lennon, with Yoko Ono, mm -hmm. um, that was published over two issues at the beginning you of 1971. Often? You, you reread it often? I've actually reread it a lot because it's, um, I've used it for research. Um, I've used it when I go back over those records. It's a fascinating time for him and for the magazine. And I got those issues in the mail. They showed up, you know, courtesy of the Post. And one of the things that I find interesting is about, it in, was re, in released in conjunction with that first solo album, John Lennon, Plastic Ono Band. That was the sort of setting for the interviews. But given the musical severity and rather outspoken quality of the songwriting on that record, were you prepared for the intensity of what he said about the Beatles and his strained relationship with Paul McCartney at the time, were you ready for that or was, did that come as a surprise? Came as a complete surprise. I mean, he had been making snarky comments about Paul and you could hear on the record that he was saying some pretty, you know, astounding and shocking things like on that song, God, his, where he goes at the end is a litany of things he doesn't believe in anymore, which 
includes Bob D Dylan and this, that, and the other thing. And finally, it includes the Beatles, you know. So, but uh, the personal intensity, the intellectual intensity, understood, you know. It was a big artistic achievement, a big brave thing for him to do. People didn't write records like that then in such personal, intimate terms. I mean, this was intimate, and it was tough. But the McCartney stuff was was it was surprising, you know, um, you know. But I, I think the feeling was just you've got to say that. What you've got to say that. And yet, at the and same time, he came to sort of regret how extreme some of what he said was, because once it's in print, you can't take it back. You can't take it back. He finally, at the time when we published it, it was called Lennon Remembers. That was the that was the interviews in the book that was published. And in time, he started calling it Lennon Regrets. <laughs> and <laughs> I don't, he never, you know, he just, he need later says it was just me shot, shooting my mouth off. I can't remember what I'd said, you know, something like that. But it had a horrible impact on Paul. Paul's comments in Rolling Stone after, you know, after once he read it, I don't know, months, a couple of, only months later, said, ah, I felt like a turd. I read that stuff and I thought, he's got me, that's me. And, <laughs> I, you know, it was painful, I think, for, for all of them. But, I've, I've been at the center of several of these kinds of relationships between these partnerships between Mick and Keith. I'm not the center, but near 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 the center, and, and Simon and Garfunkel, and they're tough. You know, you you hook with hook up with somebody when you're a teenager, as I think everybody did in these three cases, and then you find yourself all of a sudden you're a grown man and you really don't like that person anymore. <laughs> that, <laughs> and why do I have to be married to or and another situation, you know, success is its own crucible, and the drugs are all a crucible. And you know, finally, who's who's more important here? You know, who's but that's the guy? also the price and the beauty of journalism for me because it captures the moment for posterity, whatever the consequences. Yeah, and I think in the, you know, I don't, you know, I, in the end, the Lenin interview, Lenin remembers, is a critical part of Beale's history and of our times. And uh, I much later saw something that Michael Davies, who's the authorized biographer of the Beatles, said, said he, was, he saw it and he was so jealous. <laughs> he said, it was the first time he'd ever spoken. How did I get it? Yeah. It was nice. Um, you are actually uh, quite frank in the book about your opinion of the internet, the impact that it had on the magazine, and really the way it has changed journalism itself, which is particularly that curatorial authority mm. in, say, record reviews, feature writing, mm -hmm. the political coverage that Rolling Stone had right up to the start and into the start of this century. How would you, at this point, and you talk about it in the book, characterize the, quote, democracy of the Internet? Well, I, I'm, I'm bitter about the Internet for a bunch of reasons. Number one is that it literally stole the content that was being published in newspapers and magazines, and we we put it out on the internet. They never paid a fucking dime to any of us who are publishers or writers or editors, the people who did the hard work and got this great stuff. No, not no compensation whatsoever. And at the same time, in taking our stuff and they repurposing it on the internet for free, faster, and widespread. They also went to our advertisers and took our advertisers away and put them on this stuff on the internet. And admittedly, the internet is a better advertising medium, right? But they, they stole the stuff that made us valuable, they stole. And once it got hooked up to the iPhone, you know, for publishing in general, just forget it. It was for, for all kinds of things in general, forget it. Every, the iPhone, pick it up and you've got, you know, the internet and Google on it. You've got video games, movies, TV, phone, cameras, music, you know. Why bother? You can even fuck the thing, you know. And <laughs> uh, believe me, I'm sure you can. I don't know what the, the name of the app is, but I, you know. Uh, at, at the same time they did all that, they really destroyed, or something they did too, the appetite for thoughtful writing, thoughtful thinking, you know, just being thoughtful in general. And our journalism and uh, journalism most of the daily newspapers and magazines was to spend to think about it 
you know, to report it, to spend some time figuring it out in addition to what the daily, you know, information flow is of what battles being fought, but to, to learn something. And also we had the role of editing or, as David said, curating and being kind of a filter for what's important, what's responsible, what's honest. I mean, publishers, magazine, and newspaper can't get away with publishing this crap that you see on the internet, you know, of hoax conspiracies and whatever, you know, and how bad and the filth it's gotten. Because they don't have, they're not subject to any kind of regulation by the government. They're not subject to the rules of the First Amendment, you know, in which the court has said, you know, you don't, there's no such thing as absolute freedom of speech. You have to behave responsibly according to community standards. You have to do this without malice or reckless regard for the truth. And so it is just, the internet and this lack of control on it, the fact that these companies are so big and wealthy, you know, that they can somehow shut down attempts to regulate it. You can't, you have to regulate it. It's a government, the government paid, the government feels that the radio waves, the television waves are owned by the people and therefore will be made relegated on behalf of the people, right? The internet, which was financed by the Defense Department, the federal government, I mean, made, and now is subject to no tax rules in interstate commerce and no regulation as a medium of speech or communication, you know, is, is I mean, fuck me. I mean, sorry, <laughs> but I mean, that's not right. Anyway, but so I call them fucking vampires. There's also a very, I think, fundamental point Sorry for all on language. top of that is that free speech is an absolute. You either have it or you don't. It's However, not an absolute. you have to respect the power of that right and respect what you should and can be doing for the betterment, really, of you can't, the entire you, nation. No, you, it's not an absolute right. Not in a society, not in an organized society. Does somebody in here have the right to shout fire right now? I mean, if it was more crowded and we were more popular. <laughs> but I mean, there's certain things you don't have the right to do. I don't have the right to go out and libel. But you have to respect have the right. What I'm saying is you have to respect the right. I respect your right to say anything reasonable yeah. and intelligent and any opinion politically or otherwise you want to do. And I respect your right to sit here and tell me that, you know, that, uh, that Trump is right about everything, that we are. There's a child molesting pizza parlor in Washington, D.C., run by this, that, and the other thing. Uh, but do you have the right to publish that? Well, what I'm saying is you have to respect the power of what you're given and to use it well, with... If you have self-control. Some have, people do not have self-control. Well, Alex Jones, you, know, you name no. them. Well, do you imagine a time when something like Rolling Stone, in whatever form, whether print or otherwise, could appear and define its era the way Rolling Stone has defined its era? Oh, I think so. I think it'll come along. You know, it's a much more complex era coming up. As I point out in the, my book, when I was born, the population of the United States is half the size, le less than half the size it is now. And I view overall all the changes in technology and all the modern uh, stuff that's come along as good and beneficial. But right now, still in a stage that really needs to be shaped and brought under control. I mean, there's a lot of things in this world right now that really need to be restrained and have gotten too out of hand. The use of oil, for example, the use of the internet. I mean, it's all, these are all good things, you know, in a way, but they really have to be thought through. I mean, we're a huge amount of people. There has to be proper government for it. We ca it cannot, no, nothing can be allowed to self-regulate. Nothing. You know, it has to be our elected representatives, and you all have to vote and pick the right people. And if you all pick a bunch of right-wing reactionaries, then you're going to get what you deserve. And if you pick the liberals, you'll get, they, they, you know, they, you'll get a bunch of other stuff. But there's no, who else would you appoint to do this? I mean, certainly not the people them, themselves who own these things. They can't regulate themselves. They're all, to a individual, the most greedy people on earth. Excuse me. I, I, I think, I mean, these are people who want... Look, let me just stop there. <laughs> uh, what did I say? The, uh, I saw it's quote in the paper that says, every billionaire is a policy failure. I think that says it. What do you need more than a billion dollars for? The money these people have is the worst use of wealth in the world. It's 
suck away in Switzerland instead of having to helping improve our schools, our climate, or anything like that at all. And what are they doing with it? You know, I mean, you don't need it, so, you know, anyway. I made myself clear. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what you think about Fox News, um, because when they were when they were sued, um, they came into court and they said, "Well, we're not news; we're a show." And like Tucker Carlson said, "Well, you know, if anybody believes me, they have to be crazy." <laughs> but they but they misrepresent themselves, and they're really a danger. And there's no it's it's like yelling fire in a theater is not permitted with free speech. I mean, there are limits. To uh, you know, to the you know, to your freedom and free speech, and there's nobody limiting that. There's no um, n nobody's, nobody's. Well, it's interesting. The Dominion Voting Machine Company is now suing them, and it's going to be the, the best, finds the most aggressive suit ever brought against these people, and with the, with real the first one, and with real serious teeth to it. Having said that, I think they're all despicable. And having said that, what I say in a book or somewhere is Murdoch has been injecting poison, has been mainlining poison into the American system, the American democracy. And if I remember correctly, you mentioned that at one point he wanted to buy it. He, yeah, but that was before all that started, you know, before all the current Murdochian stuff. And I said no to him because for reasons I simply didn't want to sell it. But he seemed charming at the time. I think I wrote in my book, he seemed like, he looked and felt like Yoda at the time, you know? <laughs> the little short guy wrinkle. And he turned out to be Darth Vader, you know? <laughs> and, and it's despicable. I, I couldn't, God bless you. <laughs> I want to ask you a little more about a Hollywood type question. Besides Mick Jagger, who are some of the other folks that you really befriended and had a good time with? Uh, in musicians, among musicians? Yes. Uh, well, Mick, of course, uh, from from day, or uh, virtually day one, I, I think I wrote that I met him at around issue fifth, number 15 in the first year. You were at the Beggar's Banquet mixing session. Right, exactly. And we were kids, you know, he was, I was 21 or so, and I think he was 23 or 24 at the time. But Mick has been a longstanding friend. Um, uh, of the famous people who still, you know, Bono's a really good friend. Uh, and we've known each other about 20 years or so, and he, you know, he ended up being a neighbor of mine in New York, and he's now the godfather of my daughter, and his wife is the godfather of my daughter, and so forth. Uh, Bob, I had a very, I've had, had very interesting relationship, and they're not like, buddy, buddy, let's go hang out, but every time we are together or hanging out, or we, it's, it's hysterically fun with him. I mean, he's a really sharp wit, and we just trade one-liners back and forth, and. You know, he criticizes my magazines. I criticize his records. I tell them, I tell them this is, you know, everybody knows you know, your new stuff is no good, you know. I mean, the last thing you want to tell any artist. But um, and he says, you know, the crap you publish. Anyway, we have had a wonderful relationship. Contrary to this reputation he has for all these years, being kind of silent and moody, withdrawn, you know, at times mean. Uh, on the other hand, I have a great time. And Bruce is a very close friend. And... Uh, who am I missing there in the big 20? That's a pretty good yeah. list. Um, and, uh, you know, I see the most of Bruce, you know, because he's more, he lives here and, you know, the rest live elsewhere. Well, actually, one of the things you talk about in the book that I found really interesting was um, there's all of the discussions, the interviews you did with, the, the really great interviews you did with Mick and Bono you know, in the 90s. But one of the people who got away was Michael Jackson. And yeah. you talk about, you know, actually getting together with him, trying to set something up. You know, you're doing, all, doing everything you can to get this thing going, and he basically bails. And I sort of wondered, are there just some artists, celebrities that even not including the retrospect of his life subsequently, where there's just no there there. Like, beyond the work, yeah. is there really anything it was we need idea, to know, or is there, is there anything to know? That It was his idea to do this, or his manager's idea that he should do it. And then they felt, well, because Michael is the king of whatever, that it, I had to do it. You know, and I mean, it would be a news scoop no matter what. And I was all for it. And I'd rather somebody else do it because I didn't know that much about it. You know, I mean, I love his music, but I never really 
paid that much attention. It just didn't seem in my ballpark. I knew much about, but how can you say no? And then he, they wa I, he wanted to have dinner with me first before. Uh, so we went and had dinner in Los Angeles. And it was all very nice and charming and pleasant. And he's a great, nice guy, you know. But I, so I thought, well, go, you know. So I spent a, a, a long weekend really listening to everything Jackson 5, Michael Jackson, reading what little there is to it, making long lists of questions. But, you know, it's stretching it. But I just always thought, why does he want to do an interview? He really has nothing to say. There's nothing in a content of the music, other than just the music itself. And so how do you get this tambourine sound or, or the shuffles, or whatever. But there was nothing he was saying. He never said anything. I, I just, it, I didn't think there was any there there. And of course, I think he knew that and pulled out of it for that reason, decided not to do it. Because coming towards it, what were we going to talk about? I, it was an interesting experience because I went, to, I knew Diana Ross somewhat over the years. And uh, before I went out there, I, I, we had lunch together because I wanted to do some research and get some sense of what I was doing. And there was this famous story about, you know, she was brought to, he, she discovered Michael Jackson and this, that, and the other thing. On and on. This. And she says, you know, uh, this, uh, none of that is true. I mean, I really barely know the guy. <laughs> and the last time I tried to see him, I went to Neverland or his house to say hello, visit him. And I was kept waiting downstairs for two hours and finally I left. And uh, then, I don't know what else happened there. There's a couple other weird things. Oh, then, then his manager called me up and said, yeah, with Michael, you know, just into, would you mind if, it, if we could do it in the dark? I mean, maybe, you know, <laughs> maybe have some candlelight candles lit and you could do it that way. And I said, sure, whatever. You know, maybe they'll make it, you know, I don't know. But I mean. It's like some Edgar Allan Poe shit, it, you know, it's, it's it, like. <laughs> Anyway, the upshot, of course, is it never got done. We always got along well with Derek, with Michael and his camp, and I got invited as a Constellation Prize to go to the Elizabeth Taylor wedding at Neverland. So, <laughs> there. So there was a Constellation Prize. There was a Constellation, you know. It was kind of, it was fun. I mean, it was crazy. Then, at that point, Michael gave me a tour of the ranch afterwards, and we went up at, at the wedding. We went up together to an amusement park up there, and saw the Ferris wheel and the movie theater, and you go to the movie theater, and he points up and he says, see that glass gym room? That's, that's where I take all my friends, and we sit in bed, lay in bed, and watch all the cancer patients, and we watch movies together. Anyway, let's let that <laughs> set. Um, but that was a was little a oversharing, I yeah, think. Okay. Um, but it was, you know, it was, it was great. It, Michael was a magical figure. I mean, great. You know, but not, not a lot to say. Well... I could do this for days, but um, this has been... So could actually, I. <laughs> I mean, how are you folks fixed? But it's... <laughs> the book is Like a Rolling Stone, Giannis Wenner. Congratulations. And thank you Thanks. for coming. <laughs>